Aloha. What's up to everyone again? Little um, earlier today, um, 1 p.m. Um, this is Dr. Albert Lin for the Traveling Doctor uh, COVID-19 podcast. I'm going a little earlier today just because I plan on surfing today. So I found a new good uh, spot to surf and um, I kind of want to do around sunset. So I'm going to do this a little earlier and I am not working this week. So welcome to Brian coming in. Um, and uh, today I'm going to go over some of the stuff that I talked about last time because I keep getting questions about it. I don't think everyone watched the podcast. I'm going to talk about uh, Kawasaki disease um, or Kawasaki-like disease in COVID-19. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this COVID toes thing, which is somewhat related. Um, everyone uh, is talking about a lot of the uh, kind of weird manifestations of COVID-19 uh, that are coming up, especially in kids. And uh, that goes into a little bit about clotting and kidneys and everything else. And then um, I'm going to readdress the antibody test issue uh, again, as well as kind of give a little bit of an update in Hawaii and the other states because a lot of stuff are changing. And there's a lot of positive stuff. Um, I think it depends how you look at it. It's either positive or a little bit negative um, as well also. Um, I'm very cautious about all this, so I'm a little bit more negative um, about all the phase one reopening. But there's a lot of news coming out of Hawaii, what we're doing um, right now. Um, with uh, the reopening. Uh, so I guess, you know what, um, I, I think, let me start a little bit with some of the Hawaii news first, maybe, uh, um, just because maybe I'll wait for a couple more people to come on in. But uh, Hawaii, we have started to reopen. We're started to, uh, and welcome the Marissa coming in. Um, so Marissa, I am talking about, um, um, I'm talking about some of the uh, same stuff from last time with Kawasaki and um, uh, COVID-19 toes, as well as talking about hydroxychloroquine and antibody testing. But I'm also bringing, uh, I, I wanted to start with the Hawaii update. So Hawaii, it's been interesting because we are one of the states, I checked this again, with the lowest per capita deaths in the country. Uh, welcome to Jesse coming in. And um, we are the state also with the lowest uh, per capita or second lowest per capita cases. Um, Marissa says there's more cases in New York City. Again, this is one of the things I'm worried about. Uh, you see, because we have 50 different states. And if you look at the growth curves in all the different states compared also to the growth curves in every single other country, and I, I don't even mean growth curves, I mean really new case curves. Um, that's probably the better, more precise term. The new case curves in us compared to the rest of the world and Hawaii compared to like New York City or New York State and even California, it's all very different. So the problem is, is everyone, right now I think we again have 48 states that are reopening and all of them are doing things a little differently and all of them different uh, new case curves. And even within the same um, country, uh, or even within the same, sorry, state, there are different parts of the state that have different areas uh, that are better and ha that have better new case curves and others don't. So for example, um, and welcome to Sally coming in, um, Marissa says there's more cases of Kawasaki-like illness in kids. It's really, uh, this is a scary, scary disease. For example, I, I, and um, Marissa can correct me if I'm wrong, but for example, what we're doing in Hawaii is we're opening up all the beaches soon in Kauai because we have very few cases, like zero cases, one case, zero cases, three cases, like stuff like that. And in uh, New York, as I understand, central New York, sort of like the middle part of New York that's very rural and doesn't have that much going on out there, very isolated, more not heavy, dense cities, they're reopening up, whereas New York City is not. Uh, same thing, Kauai is opening up for beaches, but Honolulu is not, uh, although we may open up our beaches later if it's successful in Kauai. Um, for example, in LA, in California, LA County is not opening up, and they're still talking about sheltering in place until the end of uh for like three more months, I think. 
Hawaii, Honolulu, which again, Honolulu County, Hawaii was the most number of people. We're talking about shelter in place and stay at home until end of June, June 30th. So the goalposts, as you kind of hear, keep getting pushed back and back. Um, so that's the update. It looks like we have a little more people. I want to talk about Kawasaki disease and talk about it a little bit more. So Marissa, I think, was on with us last time and remembers what I talked about. Kawasaki disease with kids, it's scary. It's very, very scary, this Kawasaki illness-like thing. Um, and again, I want to be clear. They're saying that this is Kawasaki-like. It is not actual Kawasaki disease, although to be honest, uh, there are very few things you can't, at this point, as I can tell, you can't say that's definitely not Kawasaki disease. Kawasaki disease is sort of this constellation of, um, uh, um, of uh, symptoms. And again, it's sort of this weird rash, this fever, the uh, a strawberry tongue again, and the tongue looks like this but it looks strawberry-like, like a real, what a strawberry looks like with seeds, that would be one of the signs that we look for in Kawasaki illness and uh, no, Kawasaki disease in kids. So the concern is, is that um, the, you know, these kids who we used to say, oh, kids don't have any problem, and uh, especially as we're reopening schools, right? Because uh, other countries are reopening schools. And by the way, it's not just New York City. Welcome to Mike Andreas coming in, um, my old buddy. Um, and Marissa says, find that it is occurring several weeks after COVID is diagnosed by antibody test case in Britain as well. Yes, Marissa, this is exactly what I was bringing up. Uh, the research, some of it that I was seeing is that, uh, you know, usually it's not right away. It's about seven to 10 days or maybe up to two weeks after you get COVID-19 symptoms in kids and then you test them for it. They start to have these problems and it's really freaking scary. And it's not, I've read about studies in France now, in England, um, in China, in uh, obviously the U.S. and New York. So this is not, again, once again, you're, you're, you're sort of believing that this is a made-up disease or this is a real thing. And, and more importantly, this is a weird disease that presents not just in the lungs, right? Because what has everyone been worrying about? Everyone's been worrying about our lungs, how we breathe. And even with kids, and kids don't seem to breathe that bad with this, right? So the problem is that if we are worrying now about other things, and welcome to Janelle coming in, um, onto uh, uh, you know in the uh, uh, in this constellation of symptoms, then this is very very scary because we don't want our kids to start having you know uh, rashes. Uh, welcome to Lauren coming in. Uh, oh, by the way, guys, I realize if. Anybody wants to be like interviewed or come on to camera, it looks like I can bring people on camera on Facebook Live with my phone, but not with, uh, uh, not with my uh, computer. Uh, welcome to Sarah, welcome to Lauren coming in. Everyone's coming in, seems like from the East Coast. So um, guys, again, sorry I couldn't do this a little later. I was, I'm going surfing, I think a little later possibly. So I want to see the 4 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time for my surfing. I'm guessing that right now it's about a little after dinner time for everyone on the East Coast. So again, talking about Kawasaki disease, um, it's a little scary. So again, those symptoms, fever, um, the weird strawberry tongue, you kind of get rashes. And um, in kids, the scary thing that for Kawasaki disease I want to talk about is they always tell doctors and train us to look for Kawasaki disease, even if we don't have kids, right? Or I'm not a pediatrician, but if you see this sort of thing with kids, what's the worrisome thing? And welcome to Jen Blank coming in. God, all my old Hawaii people coming in, um, or all my old Herrick's people coming in. Um, again, Kawasaki disease, the number one concerning thing that you worry about is these kids, if they truly have Kawasaki disease, you want to treat them fast. And how do you treat them? You give them steroids, possibly, but you give them IVIG, right? And where, again, we've heard this, IVIG, which is plasma, it's sort of used interchangeably, is the uh, thing that they've been trying to study to help people with, interestingly, um, COVID-19 disease. 
Um, welcome, Jen. Yeah, no problem. So again, Kawasaki disease, the concern is not that you get this weird strawberry tongue and that you get weird um, skin stuff or even COVID toes that you hear of. It's that you get, for kids, aneurysms, aortic aneurysms. That's some scary, scary stuff because that means your aorta, welcome to Josh coming in, uh, my old Stanford buddy. So the scary thing about aortic aneurysms in Kawasaki disease is it's what it sounds like. An aneurysm of the aorta is very scary. The aorta is the major artery coming out of your heart. So if you get an aneurysm from that, this is things that we don't normally see until middle age and adulthood and people that have coronary artery disease. If you get a ballooning out or an aneurysm of the aorta, it is scary because that could do a couple things. It might do nothing, but it could burst. And if it bursts, you or it dissects, uh, or if you can aortic dissection, you can die. If aortic aneurysm bursts, you die. It's a very life-threatening thing. This is how, um, again, um, you can look this up. Uh, Jack Tripper or John Ritter from um, Three's Company, this is how he died. Kids should not be getting this stuff. And if they get it, it's very, very serious and it's very permanent. So we wanna avoid these things. And again, I, I have to be clear, we do not know that kids with Kawasaki-like illness in COVID-19 get your typical Kawasaki disease coronary aneurysm, okay? So, um, and Lauren says, it's similar to the disease, children's disease, that runs through the daycares and schools this time of the year. I can't think of the name, but kids usually get it from water porks. Um, Lauren, I'm not really sure which illness you're talking about that way. But again, the, the, the thing that is good, if you will, about this disease and COVID toes is that it's easily, it's more visually available, right? If you see weird rashes, oh, Coxsackie, Coxsackie, yeah. So Marissa, uh, Coxsackie, so Coxsackie illness is different from Kawasaki disease. Kawasaki, they sound the same, Kawasaki like the Japanese motorcycle and Coxsackie, it's different. And I gotta refresh myself a little bit on Coxsackie, but as I understand it, Kawasaki is much worse than Coxsackie. But either way, if you start seeing, um, uh, welcome to Lisa coming in. Lisa from um, Herrick's, my old high school. I saw her in a good uh, Central Park photos. So welcome to Lisa coming in. So <clears throat> again, Kawasaki disease is way worse for kids. But even if it was Kawasaki disease in adults, what I worry about is that this is not just Kawasaki-like illness. It is actually Kawasaki disease type stuff, and you would get aneurysms in these kids. Now, you may say, well, why are we suddenly seeing Kawasaki-like illness or even COVID toes? So I'll describe that a little bit later. The reason why we're seeing this is uh, twofold. Um, yeah, okay, so Lauren does mention they do have rash and sores. So I think... The point is, is that we will need to be cautious, right? We will want to talk to um, and keep a close eye on this because maybe it's just Coxsackie disease, but maybe it's Kawasaki disease, like disease. And welcome to Clara, my old Stanford classmate, coming in from uh, California, I think. So, um, so Kawasaki disease, Coxsackie virus, whatever. These things, they look the same with viruses, and welcome to L coming in from Hawaii. They look the same with fever, rashes, ulcers, but the more worrisome thing is the Kawasaki disease. And the most worrisome thing, again, is that this is all because they have COVID-19. So my point is, is if you suspect, I mean, at this point, I think every parent is kind of paranoid anyway. So if you, you suspect fever, weird rash, whatever, you should be testing your kids anyway. And as I understand it, um, it's a little easier to get your normal, again, PCR test, which I'll go into because there's a lot of controversy that the rapid tests, including the a Abbott tests, are not so good anymore. Um, but I'll go into that a little bit later. So let me talk a little bit about the uh, COVID toes, okay? So a lot of people are wondering about these uh, COVID toes, right? So COVID toes are, um, how am I gonna say this? Uh, they're kind of a similar looking thing. COVID toes are, um, the best way I can describe it, um, welcome to Derek coming in. Um, the, the best way I can describe it is COVID toes are kind of like if you had frostbite, right? So if your fingers, because as I understand, it's also fingers can look like this, but also toes, and welcome to Laurie coming in as well, and uh, welcome to Derek. So COVID toes um, 
are kind of what you would uh, imagine they look like. So imagine that you have um, frostbite um, or you have uh, in your fingers or your toes. Say you're outside without mittens or gloves. And, and by the way, I have something very similar. I have something called Raynaud syndrome. You can look this up. R-A-U-N-A-U-D-S, Raynaud syndrome. I have a mild form of this, and this is why I try to surf with the sun because um, my fingers and toes can get cold. Welcome to Lori, and um, yeah, Lori, I'm talking a little bit about COVID toes, and I already talked a little bit about Kawasaki-like illness um, in kids before this. And so the worrisome thing right now is that we're talking about rashes and how things that look weird in your fingers and toes, which basically looks like frostbite, can um, be indication of COVID-19. Now it's a little scary because we're like, well, why is this happening? Again, my thing is I think we have to start looking at COVID-19 and I think a lot of people realize this as a type of illness that is not just of your lungs, it's of your whole body. It can be a vasculitis. So what's a vasculitis? Because that's what Kawasaki disease is. It's a vasculitis. Uh, it's a fancy way of saying that it is a illness an itis, right, an inflammation of vascular system. Vascular system is any artery, any capillary, anything like that. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Lauren, so, like, it, my point is, is that it can look blue or red. And welcome to Lynn coming in, another old Herrick's uh, friend. So, Lauren, the, the thing is, is that, um, and I don't know if the Kawasaki-like illness kids, I haven't read enough about this, if when, and the COVID toes, for example, specifically, if they have COVID toes, is that it's uh, low oxygen that that shows too. So Marissa, yeah, exam. The COVID is an inflammation of blood vessels. That's what I, I've said and I've repeated. It's a vasculitis. That's what Kawasaki disease is, a vasculitis of medium and large size arteries. And welcome to Greg coming in. Um, okay, so Lori, uh, yeah, you can watch this a little bit later. So Kawasaki disease... The reason why it's scary is, and also the COVID toes, is that it looks like um, vasculitis is something we're going to have to worry about. And the reason why I worry about this is what does this mean long term? For Kawasaki disease, we worry about the long term effects of the aorta and aneurysms. We want to make sure that it doesn't balloon out. We want to treat with IVIG and steroids. But again, I don't know if this is how we treat COVID-19. We've been talking about it this way even before we knew about Kawasaki-like illness uh, for COVID-19 patients. Welcome to Andy coming in. So um, the other thing, um, so again, COVID toes, it looks frostbitten and the fingers or your toes, I'm gonna show you your to my toes, look uh, frostbitten a little bit. And I'm not sure whether that really means that your oxygen level is low. But again, if you start looking, and welcome to Adam coming in, if you start looking at your kid's toes or your own toes, your own fingers, and seeing that you have something strange and you realize that you're feverish, you realize whatever. Again, I think everyone would be paranoid enough to be like, what the hell is going on? Especially it's summertime. We shouldn't have cold fingers and cold toes mostly. I mean, I do get it because I go out and surf in the water so I can get some cold toes and fingers. But if you have that, then you should be thinking about um, COVID-19. The reason why we worry about vasculitis, seeing, uh, Marissa says, seeing higher blood sugar in kids being diagnosed with Kawasaki-like disease. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I, Marissa, I don't know about this. We're, we're, we're learning new things all the time. As I understand it, I don't think that you normally see high blood sugar in Kawasaki disease or diabetes or pre-diabetes. This is really scary because essentially what is diabetes? Diabetes is an elevation of blood sugar in your system and you cannot absorb it well enough. Now there's two types of diabetes, right? There's diabetes types one, which a lot of people are not really sure how it happens. It happens in kids. They tend to be skinnier and it happens usually after disease right? It also, one of the thoughts is, is that diabetes is caused by infection. So this is scary. This Kawasaki, this COVID-19, will it be shown to start causing diabetes in kids? And it's really not benign. The diabetes type two is what you think about the older, I call it like fatter obesity disease of diabetes, where people get diabetes because they can't absorb the amount of sugar. Your pancreas kind of burns out. 
your pancreas size doesn't make enough insulin to pull that sugar in. So uh, Marissa, everything is really early right now. I don't wanna say, oh, well, COVID-19 definitely causes diabetes in kids or adults, and, and, and COVID-19 definitely will cause Kawasaki disease. But again, is it a risk? They're seeing higher blood sugar. Again, little kids generally uh, should not be having diabetes. And, and, and again, a history and a long life, or uh, if you're living with, diabetes, that's almost a worse thing long term, then you're at risk at, at, at uh, uh, all the things that come with diabetes, coronary artery disease, um, um, you know, kidney disease is the worst thing. And I want to start talking about that because that's another what we call extra pulmonary manifestation of COVID-19. And what do I mean by that? That's fancy lingo for saying normally what we've always been worried about or the main thing has been breathing lungs with uh, COVID-19 patients, getting them off the ventilator. What they're also finding is a lot of these kids with Kawasaki-like illness have severe symptoms and are on uh, higher oxygen or even the ventilator. Um, uh, I think there are a couple cases of that. I have to double check that. But again, the extra pulmonary manifestations of COVID-19. So that includes kidney stuff. Again, this is not new news, but as all you have seen and heard, there are a lot of uh, people with COVID-19 uh, that end up having not just clotting problems, the strokes we hear about in young patients, but um, uh, kidney disease. They need to go on dialysis and some need to go on it permanently. Welcome to Erica coming in uh, from Europe, I think. Um, so, I mean, that's scary. No one wants to be on dialysis at all, and no one wants to be on dialysis permanently, right? But why, okay, I think I need to back up a little bit. Why does dialysis happen? Why does kidney failure happen? Why does it happen? Why do you suddenly have problems with your kidneys in anything, any disease, diabetes, general chronic kidney disease with high blood pressure, or with maybe COVID-19? Why do you stop having diabetes? Or uh, why do you start having uh, chronic kidney disease and mean dialysis? Why you need to is I got to explain a little bit about the function of the kidney. What does the kidney do? The kidney filters out your blood, right? The kidney filters out your blood and it gets the waste out and it reabsorbs the blood and the good stuff. Or, well, the blood itself doesn't really go through. It filters it. You can imagine it's like a sponge, right? And um, the problem is, is that as the arteries or really the capillaries of the kidneys get destroyed and they can be clotted up like in COVID-19. They can have problems where they build up uh, uh, deposits and just have bad disease from diabetes. And, and then you can imagine it's hard to filter through these kidneys over time and it doesn't reabsorb the right nutrients and reabsorb the electrolytes the right way and you, you get into kidney failure. So the concern is, is that COVID-19 is uh, happening that uh, uh, is causing it this this problem. So Erica mentioned she's stuck in Key West. Yeah, Erica, man, I've been stuck in Hawaii. I love it here, but I can't get off island. So it's a little tough recently. Lauren says, um, so Lauren says they're worried about the restriction of oxygen to org organs causing them to alter its function. Lauren, you know, actually that's a brilliant um, idea um, and it makes sense physiologically, but it's hard to, um, and welcome to John Keen. Gosh, all my old Herrick friends coming in. Uh, it, it, and, and welcome to Emily, uh, or sorry, actually just John coming in. So, you know, Lauren, uh, so Lauren mentioned restriction of oxygen to organs, causing them to alter its function. Uh, Lauren, that's a really good theory. Um, but again, I think one of the things that we have to, um, think about and welcome to Aaron coming in, um, is that, um, it may not, well, you have to say why, how is it restricting oxygen to organs because the way oxygen gets or, uh, to organs is very, um, uh, it has to flow, right? Flow from the bloodstream through what? From the aorta to major arteries down to like the iliac arteries down to the, you know, the femoral arteries. And then you go further and further, but your organs don't get 
and like say your carotid arteries, they, they don't get oxygen just from those big arteries. They get it from the capillary. So Lauren, what I'm saying is, I don't think this disproves that it's a vasculitis or an inf I still think the underlying problem and all the doctors I've heard of who've treated this still think it's a vasculitis and inflammation of the, not just arteries, but the capillaries, right? Because capillaries are what? The end organ, uh, the end level of the arteries. They are one cell. They're only one cell thick. And that's how the oxygen passes across that one cell level to get to all the organs, to get to the brain, to get to the kidney, to get to whatever. And so my, my interpretation of this is the Kawasaki-like illnesses, the clotting problems, the kidney disease, the COVID toes, everything is a result of this inflammation of the capillaries and a vasculitis of it that prevents the oxygen from getting across. And that's why you even also get these, even to the brain where you get these uh, uh, you know, people of such low oxygen, but they're still talking, they're still functioning. So it's very, very, um... oh yeah, so Lauren, I see what you're saying. So yeah, yeah, it is, right. Because I've been matching all these fancy terms, but, but yeah, essentially, if you wanna boil it down to maybe loss of oxygen, and welcome to Aaron coming in. So uh, generally, Aaron is coming in from Mexico again. So Aaron, we're talking about Kawasaki disease in uh, children, uh, COVID toes, uh, um, dialysis, strokes, and why there's all this manifestation outside the body or outside the lungs in COVID-19 patient kids and adults and everything. And again, Lauren was mentioning, who also has a medical background, that it's loss of oxygen to the end, what we call end organs, right? And it's, I think it's probably by vasculitis and inflammation of the middle and lower level arteries, but it, it could be, uh, but generally the end effect is you lose oxygen to these things. So one thing I gotta bring up that's important about COVID toes. Um, what they're finding, at least the articles that I've seen, is that COVID-19 toes, this frostbitten look, that purple look in your toes and your fingers, is not permanent. Some of the doctors I'm reading and studying, again, this is early, so it might change, but what I'm reading is that the COVID-19 toes will disappear slowly, and you will disappear, and that frostbitten look will disappear again. And you do get some numbness and tingling, but eventually it goes away. It, it sounds like, to me, from reading it, like minor frostbite, but it eventually does go away. Sort of like, again, maybe that's why you're having problems. Even, remember, we haven't talked about this for a while, but the anosmia, the difficulty with smelling. Why does that happen? Well, you can imagine a situation, too, that nerves, a lot of people don't know this, but nerves arteries and veins all run together. Why does that happen? Well, I mean, nerves are living organisms and cells too. They need energy too. In fact, nerves burn up more oxygen than any other cell in the body. You can look this up. You know, more than heart cells, more than, you know, muscle cells that are exercising. Your oxygen is primarily used for your head, which is why it's important when you're drowning or you're doing CPR, you're trying to get that oxygen. What is it for? To every other organ. So, the concern really that I have is that um, maybe even with the, the nose and nerve cells for the nose for smelling, maybe that's part of the reason. Again, this is all theory, but as a doctor, it's starting to become clear. My point is, what do you get away from this? Is that, and welcome to Kim coming in from my old Herrick's uh, alum buddy as well. Kim, a lot of Herrix people are here. John Keen, Mike Andreas, Lauren, Marissa Love, everyone is here. And welcome to Laura coming in from California. A lot of people today. Um, so yeah, Kim, I am talking and welcome to Laura. Uh, Kim, I am talking, Kim and Laura, both being parents, uh, I am talking about Kawasaki disease, COVID toes, um, strokes, uh, clotting problems, dialysis. Why is this all happening in COVID-19 toes? And to boil it down, Lauren gave a good analogy. It's because of loss of oxygen to the end organs and vasculitis, inflammation of the um, uh, end organ arterioles and capillaries. Capillaries are that end, if, when it goes from the aorta to the iliac artery or carotid artery, femoral artery, whatever artery, and then uh, brachial artery, and then goes down and down and down all the way to your fingers, all the way to your toes, and all the way to your kidneys. 
and all these things, and even, you know, maybe to the brain. Remember, we're hearing about strokes. So this is the scary, scary thing, especially for our kids. I mean, I don't have kids, but I can imagine if you have kids that start to have this Kawasaki-looking tongue and Kawasaki, uh, or, you know, the strawberry tongue, they call it, and weird rash and other things, this is very scary. Also for the long-term effects, because you don't want them to have kidney disease and everything else um, long-term. You don't want them to be on dialysis or need to go on dialysis later. You don't want to worry about this. So my point is, every, and this is what I think is important, you know, all those people who are not doctors, who are saying, hey, well, Kawasaki disease is, mm, it doesn't do that much, you know? It's bad, you can get it and recover from it, and then I have antibodies. Right now, I mean, I'll be honest, at one point I almost used to think that too. I was like, well, I want to just have antibodies and be, have recovered from it and then not worry about it. And then I can go and travel and do these other things, even though that hasn't been set as a policy yet. The point is, maybe you don't want to get it at all, ever, you know? You don't even want to get sick from it. Not like the flu where you might be able to recover. You don't want to get it and you don't want your kids to get it. And again, everyone, I know what's going to happen. There are going to be those conspiracy nuts out there that is, are just going to be saying, everyone's just trying to frighten us. Everyone's just trying to frighten us and you and your kids. And they're against us opening up America and, and getting this very political. Again, I try not to stay political because I am a scientist and a doctor. I'm trying to keep it as normal as possible. This is about your body. This is about your kid's body. So one thing that concerns me about that is even with the vaccine, Will a vaccine eventually, because what's a vaccine? It's often an inactivated virus. Will a vaccine put us at risk of all of these symptoms? You know, put us at risk of Kawasaki-like illness and COVID toes and strokes and kidney disease and whatever. My, my, my thought is no, because no one, number one, no one would release a vaccine ideally that causes that. But again, they're trying to ramp up production, ramp up research. I would be really, really concerned that any amount of disease would cause that. Number one, we definitely don't want a live virus vaccine, but you want an inactivated virus vaccine at least or uh, something that would have no way of causing it. So this is something I'm going to keep my eyes out for. So Lauren, yeah, let me go into antibody testing because Lauren brings up a little question and comment here. Lauren says, speaking of antibody tests, in New York they have expanded tests and you can get it at your doctor's office. Just make sure they send the tube to Quest or Abbott. Yeah, okay, so Lauren, I want to go into this again. Um, as I talked about a little before, and welcome to Beth coming in. Beth, welcome. A lot of Herrick's people coming in. Uh, from um, New York, I guess 1 p.m. is a good time, uh, Hawaii time, to do this podcast because it's what, like uh, 7 p.m. or 7.30 p.m. now almost for people. So uh, Beth, talking about uh, antibody testing, I talked a lot about Kawasaki disease and extra pulmonary uh, or other organ uh, manifestations of COVID-19 and why that's scary and what to look for. So you can go back and, and rewatch this a little bit later. But Beth, I'm talking about antibody testing now in Lauren. And antibody testing, as I said yesterday or last podcast, you want it to be the Abbott PCR or the, the, uh, a normal PCR test, or you want to do antibody testing from Abbott laboratories, or you want it from a legit lab. You don't want to go to all these third-party clinic labs that have tests that are bad and manufactured from China. As you've noticed today, the news has also said a lot of the masks are bad that are manufactured from China, other places. There's a little bit of confusing news. I need to um, uh, qualify this. They've said that some of the Abbott tests are really poor and have a lot of false negatives. I gotta, I've got to clarify, those are the rapid tests, not the blood draw tests from Abbott. Those are the rapid point of care tests from Abbott, what they call POC tests. Those are the ones they use in the White House. And why do they use them in the White House? It's because it's super rapid. It's sort of like a blood test, like a finger prick test, and then they test that, and that's the test from Abbott tests. Welcome to Walter coming in from California. So, um, uh, yeah, Sarah, so Lauren is mentioning that in, I guess, New York, you can schedule an antibody test. And again, you want to get the blood-drawn antibody test. You don't want to get the finger prick test, right? The finger prick rapid test, whether it's Abbott or anybody, I, I would not recommend a, a finger prick rapid test. I would 
for antibodies at all because the, 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 the data right now looks really bad. Either Abbott's going to need to redevelop this, restudy it, show that it really works well, or maybe it's being done poorly, right? Maybe someone is not pricking the finger enough. Maybe you're not getting enough blood. That's my biggest concern. You're not getting enough blood like you do when you check for blood sugar. Maybe you need more blood. But my point is, is why not just do it the right way? Get your blood drawn. It's one tube. I had it done myself. One tube of blood, you draw it, and then you really know whether you have the antibodies or not. Now, again, I got to clarify, nobody wants this disease. Like, I, I was antibody negative, and right now I'm kind of glad I'm not. Uh, I never had it even because we're worried about all these later results of the disease that you could have long-term kidney damage or diabetes or strokes or um, – um, these other, you know, problems, the rashes, the, the smelling thing. Now, again, I, I don't know because we don't have enough data because the disease is so early that these are long term complications. A lot of these things seem to happen really intensely. And while you're suffering the symptoms of disease, the trouble breathing, the loss of oxygen, different things. So I, I'm not trying to imply that this happens long term, but maybe there is a concern for it. So, uh, Lauren says, I have called around and they charge $50 for a rapid test that's not accurate, but they also offer the blood draw. Go for the blood draw. Lauren, 100% agree. If it's covered by insurance and a lab will do both, I mean, I know people don't like getting their blood drawn, but again, would you rather have it done right or would you have it rather have it done painlessly and like whatever? I mean, I wish this was a painless way, but it's like the difference of fast food and a burger from McDonald's versus a real cooked burger. And I, I don't know why I'm saying this because I like burgers, but you know, that's my point. Rapid testing is not better than good testing with a blood. Brian, yeah, oh God, Brian, I didn't even think about that. So Brian's saying great, because Brian, as some of you know from my other podcast, is one of my major friends that had COVID-19 and is positive for the anti or from the PCR test. And I'm guessing for the antibodies, but he doesn't really need a test for it because he's been diagnosed with it. So Brian, I mean, there is that concern about long-term complications. I think most of the complications are early on, like Brian lost his loss of smell. He lost his sense of smell. Um, and Brian, can you tell us for the audience here, have you gotten any of your smell back, like fully, partially, or what? I'm curious about that. So Lauren mentions blood draw is always more accurate and we tell all our patients. Yeah, but you see, so again, Lauren, that's what I think the problem is in the news. The news is giving this clickbait information. Abbott tests are horrible. They don't work. But, you know, if you just read it very quickly, you don't realize that they're talking about the rapid point of care test. Oh, great. That's excellent news. So Brian mentions the smell came back. And this is the first confirmation I have from a real COVID-19 uh, patient that they got their smell back. I've heard it anecdotally from the news. And again, I, I have to ask my other friend, uh, for some of my Herrick's friends who don't know, and I'm pretty sure I can tell this because she posted it publicly, to Lauren, to Beth, everyone out there, Jen Adele uh, had COVID-19. She was positive for the antibody. She was really sick. Um, so Lauren also mentions if the news got half of the stuff right, I would be amazed. Yeah, good point, Lauren. So it's the news goes by clickbait. Uh, titles and no one tends to read these news articles and then everyone freaks out and the media aren't doctors and they don't know they just hear Abbott Abbott tests suck and then no no I mean I think Abbott tests are still the standard until something comes along is better better but you want to get the antibody test and if you don't and again that is the blood draw antibody test is different from the nasal PCR swab test People are still confusing these tests. They just hear testing is bad. All tests are bad. And they're, you know, they over, they, they give false positive or what I worry about more, they give false negatives. Um, you know, the, these are bad, you know, this is a bad way to dis disseminate the news, unfortunately. Um, Brian mentions, mostly might have a little bit of loss. I still occasionally smell propane. That's really strange. So Brian, I didn't know this, that when you have that COVID-19, whatever thing, you smell a weird after smell, like a propane gas smell, that's really weird. I don't know why that is. Again, you know, like doctors and researchers are going to have stuff to study for years after this. So um, Lauren mentions that our friend Jen Adele also had COVID-19, but has a strong immune system. 
So Lynn asks, with all these new symptoms, how, uh, how can, can the virus be mutating? How can we be sure the vaccine will even work six to 12 months from now? Um, Lynn, you're right. Um, I, I don't know. Again, I want to qualify for everyone. I am not a virologist. I'm not an infectious disease doctor. I'm, I'm not an immunologist, and I'm not someone who developed vaccines. So I don't know enough about this, and that is scary, that if the virus mutates a little bit, that whether the vaccine can work. Again, from what I've heard from the immunologists and the Fauci's and those people, the disease, when I, I gotta explain this. When a virus mutates, uh, when it tends to mutate, not the entire thing, like it mutates from like a Volkswagen to a Toyota, you know? Uh, uh, the, when, a, when a virus mutates, what mutates are the proteins on its surface, the stuff that attaches to the lung cells, to the kidney cells, to all the stuff that it messes up. And the vaccine tends to target the proteins and stuff on those uh, 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 proteins. It targets those things. And what they're saying is that even when the virus is changing, like from China to Italy, from Italy to Iran to whatever, that it's not changing that much. So I'm still optimistic that the vaccine will work. But again, it's a it's like a fingers crossed thing. I don't know for sure. Um, so yeah, uh, that, that is, a, but it is a concern. It is a concern. Anyone who says we're sure this vaccine will work for everybody might not. Maybe they'll ha still have to keep redeveloping the vaccine and, and that would suck. And that would mean that we are living with this. Or again, it will slowly change into COVID-20, right? It's going to last long enough to be a COVID-20. I wouldn't be surprised if it's still work happening or there's a new type of COVID that comes out the end of 2020, which is very likely, or in 2020, that they're going to have to start calling it COVID-20, right? At what point do you still say this is the same COVID-19 you call it COVID-20? Man, and the stock market's going to hate that. And so will the rest of like the medical community and everyone else. Um, so... Uh, uh, Brian mentions, in my case, that's just how I describe it. Everything kind of smelled like a gas metal or something. Wow, that's really, really crazy. I, I sort of wonder what everyone else who had the nose damage and anosmia, uh, what they had. Sorry, guys, I'm looking out my window. It's starting to get cloudy, which is crappy because I don't want to surf out in the cold when um, the clouds are in. Um, I know everyone's really pissed at me because I'm in Hawaii right now. I get to enjoy it anyway. So Lauren mentions we are going to have more than... One, depending on age group, kind of similar to what we have for the flu currently. So Lauren, again, I love this. I love having someone that is medically oriented uh, on this show as well. Lauren, I 100% agree. It's like the flu, you know, they, when they call it like H1N1, right? Okay, that's a great example. H1N1 or H2N3. What do those things stand for? The H and the N, uh, God, I forget what the H stands for, but the N is neur neuraminidase. It's a protein on the virus thing and there's different versions on it. So when you hear H1N1, H2N whatever, you're talking about those proteins on the influenza virus uh, outside that they target to make the vaccine. And in that same way, that's what's going to happen with COVID-19. We just don't target, you know, I don't know that it's the same proteins. Again, I haven't read the articles enough to know if it's still the neuraminidase protein and the H protein, whatever that is. I, I got, I think it's, I forgot what it is. I, I know I, I, I've studied this before, but again, so we're going to have COVID-19 and we'll, we'll have COVID-20. The question is, is COVID-20 the same virulence? Does it have the same lethality and mortality and everything? Or maybe it migrate, it, it mutates into something that's less, you know? Um, so, okay, so Derek mentions, um, my coworker tested positive today. I worked on the same car he did, but I didn't touch it since last Friday, and it sat outside in the sun since then. I sanitized it, and I ran it through the car wash yesterday before I worked on it. Took the swab test today to be sure. Yeah, you know, Derek, um, not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. I mean, again, you know, you're what's called a contact, right? You're officially a contact tracing, tracer person. Welcome to LV coming in, my old coworker from Hawaii. So uh, 
Uh, LV, uh, we're talking about a lot of things. Um, man, we've jumped all over the board today, but mainly about extra pulmonary outside of the lung manifestations of COVID-19. We've talked about antibody testing and why it's not so great for the rapid test. You never want a rapid test for antibody tests. You want blood tests. And we've talked about uh, hypoxia and we've talked about um, you know what you need to be careful. Derek just asked that his coworker worked on a car and he tested positive, but he, uh, he didn't touch it, but he sanitized and ran through the car wash, but he was close. He was close maybe to his coworker and to a car that he touched. So you're a contact, Derek. So it is, I think, reasonable to get a nasal swab test. You know, again, um, my guess is that unless you have symptoms, you'll probably be negative and you didn't have enough time. But again, I would say, Derek, if you are negative, you're in a nasal test, but a couple more days after the test or a week from now or two weeks from now, you get more symptoms, swab again, swab a second time to make sure because your first test might have been too early. A lot of people don't understand that too. The nasal swab is probably most accurate when you have the most symptoms and are the most sick. And that's different from the antibody test. Again, you don't get the antibody test and the blood test when you're sick. You, they, they tell you to be symptom free for a week before you get the antibody test. So that's another thing that most people don't know. The rapid antibody test, which I, again, I do not recommend that one, the finger prick test, or the blood draw antibody test, you have to be seven days negative, or that's what they recommend, because they want you to be what? Recovered from it, and you have the antibodies. And that's what I think is um, something that you should know generally. So um, I guess I'll talk a little bit more. I think maybe where I'll, I've been, I haven't talked about a lot of the other um, drug studies, but uh, the last thing I want to mention is this word on hypoxia. So a lot of people have also asked me, and it's come up like, do I need a pulse oximeter? Have you, you, you heard about this, right? You've seen it in the hospital. When you go to the hospital or they're taking your vitals, they put the clip on you, even when you go to a doctor's office. And that a hypoxia meter, uh, in, interesting trivia, the, I think the uh, Japanese guy, scientist who invented this, he just died, not a COVID-19, which would be in a way ironic, but he, uh, uh, it, it measures the oxygen in your blood. So, uh, okay, Lauren, is that the official recommendation? It's two weeks. Okay, great. Okay. So my point is, is that you have to recover. So two weeks now is the recommendation afterwards, after, after you've recovered from um, or tested negative for COVID-19. Okay. So Lauren, I'm sort of interested in New York, what the recommendations are. Do you not get antibody testing at all unless you definitely had a COVID test or can you still be recommended to get your antibody testing even if you did not get a nasal test, but you were highly suspicious uh, for having those symptoms or a contact or something. Uh, to be honest, I don't even know what it is in Hawaii because we aren't using that in the hospitals yet. We're still sticking with the nasal test because it's quick and, you know, and, and more available right now. Okay, okay. Lauren, good to know that. Good to know that. Um, uh, so I guess that's more a safety thing. In Hawaii, for example, they aren't requiring that. They, you know, I was able to just go in and get the antibody drawn uh, without them asking about my COVID status. They just did it. Um, they, uh, they, they just, uh, but I went to, I gotta be clear, I went to a lab. I didn't go to any office. But again, I think offices may be putting this in, in protocol because they don't want anyone who's even at risk of or a COVID-19 patient a suspect to come in unless you're negative. And welcome to Pierre coming in. So um, again, about hypoxia and the pulse oximeter, a lot of people are saying, hey, well, do I need one of these, right? Do I need one of them? Do, and again, you, there are a ton out on the market. I'm not even really sure which is a good one. Uh, we have the standard, the, the sort of the, gr the gray ones that we attach to the, the blood pressure machine and the other things that uh, are not the same, you'd want to get a, a market one. And those run about anywhere from like 40 to $60 from what I can tell. And they even have ones that go to your like uh, smartphone app, you know, and can test and are uh, Bluetooth oriented. But the point is, is do they, uh, do, should people get this? Should people get this $50 pulse oximeter and just, uh, you know, protect themselves and see and test themselves all the time for oxygen and see if they have problems. Because one of the thoughts is that maybe if you test yourself with just 
a pulse oximeter, which is very easy to get. And I mean, again, yeah, not everyone is extra $50, but if you did for your family, maybe if you test it and you see that your oxygen is lower, you would have higher suspicion to what? Get tested for nasal PCR for your COVID-19. Um, the problem is, is that I, I don't know that you absolutely really need this. How useful will it be compared to just saying, I have fever, I have chills, I have muscle aches, I have you know, Kawasaki disease, every whatever. I don't think it's a really good idea. So I, I tend to agree with Lauren, where Lauren says everyone playing a doctor is no good. And I think the problem is it also gives you a false sense of security, right? So say you get that pulse oximeter and it reads 99%, 98%, right? That's great for you, but say it starts reading 95%, 94%, 93% for your kid. Is that something you gotta worry about? Is it not? I mean, it's almost too much information, right? You're gonna to get too many people coming in to get checked and there's no way to really use that, you know? So yeah, Lauren, no, trust me. I know about WebMD. I know, uh, let's call it Dr. YouTube, right? The YouTube uh, School of Medicine. Everyone thinks they're an expert. And again, I am not a virologist or an ID doctor, but I'm an internal medicine doctor. I work in an ICU. I intubate patients. I take care of patients who have the flu and pneumonia. And I've seen patients die on the ventilator, gotten them off the ventilator all the time. No one has done this. Not everyone has. So the problem is, is I, I agree. And I didn't think about this before. Welcome to Than coming in also and Linda coming in from Maryland. The problem with everyone getting their own personal pulse oximeter and what we call uh, wearable devices, right? Medical, and I, I love this because for example, that's a big business thing for Apple. Apple wants everyone to have wearable technology. Think about it as like Fitbit Plus, right? Not just getting your pulse, not just getting your, your steps, but getting your oxygen, getting your, um, your temperature, getting your uh, rhythm of your heartbeat. You know, like the, the, Apple's trying to do this kind of thing, you know? Okay, interesting. So Brian says, while sick, I tested myself multiple times a day with a pulse oximeter. Both Beth and Martha were telling me to go to the ER if it dropped into the low 90s. Yeah, okay, so Brian, so that's a good point. Okay, Lauren, I, I take this back. I would agree that maybe your average person should not have a pulse oximeter. But if you're like Brian, right, and you've tested positive for COVID-19 by PCR, I think there is a role for a pulse oximeter then. And again, it's $50. Um, I, I mean, I don't know how easy it is to find outside. You can get on the internet everywhere with every different company. But the point is, is that if you have a pulse oximeter and you're COVID-19 positive, there is a role that if you're starting to get hypoxic, you need to go and get checked out at the hospital and, and you know, even chest x-ray, you know, and maybe treated with higher uh, diseases and um, uh, for a higher uh, or for a higher level of uh, disease burden or that you're a more moderate or serious patient. This is a good segue into hydroxychloroquine. I do have some new hydroxychloroquine news, by the way. And Lauren says, I understand for once you have been set up through a doc. Um, I would do that with patients discharged from rehab after surgery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah. So Lauren, yeah. So I think we're both on the same page. The point is, is that if you're a real COVID patient, there's probably a role for hypoxia, uh, monitoring and pulse oximetry, but not for your average person, not for your normal idiot at, uh, uh, in line in Costco. Again, they're probably putting themselves more at risk by constantly going to Costco. But so anyway, uh, talk about mild, moderate, and severe. So there is interesting news. I talked about this a little yesterday or last podcast about hydroxychloroquine. And it's mostly bad news. Hydroxychloroquine in a major NIH study with azithromycin is no different than nothing, placebo, for recovery and even deaths for severe hospitalized patients. It's a bad news. So that's why you've basically not heard about hydroxychloroquine in the news again. So that's really bad. If anything, they saw more heart defect or more heart side effects from hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Again, azithromycin alone has been known to cause QT prolongation and problems with the rhythm of the heart that's dangerous. So that's concerning. So that means that maybe there's no role for it in the hospital. And Brian also mentions that my wife is 
My wife, Beth, is a nurse, and Martha's a doctor friend. So, yeah, okay. And Brian, again, I think there's 100% a role for any positive COVID-19 patients to test for oxygen. I, I mean, but my point is, is that you, there's a standard, right? It's not everyone who is just trying to test themselves and their dog and their cats. Welcome to Georgina, my old high school friend coming in from New Jersey. So um, follow-up to the hydroxychloroquine study. Now, my friend just forwarded me an article, and this is the study I'm most interested for for hydroxychloroquine. They are setting up a placebo, uh, you know, prospective study with a placebo arm to test mild patients. So, for example, patients like Brian, giving them hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin versus giving you nothing and seeing what? Seeing, number one, whether you get sicker and go to the hospital, number two, if you die, you know, or number three, if you have any sort of other complications. So that's the study I'm most interested in. There's just signing up people for that now in the NIH. So the problem is, I love this, that the NIH is still doing the study. I think that will be the definitive study for hydroxychloroquine. The other one was for hospitalized patients, but most of us will never be hospitalized. Even Brian, who is super sick like a dog, was not hospitalized. He was checked up by his nurse wife, uh, Beth, and you know a bunch of us checked in on him. But the point is, is that you know the definitive study, or at least one of the definitive studies for hydroxychloroquine, will be this NIH study testing mild patients with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. In other words, people who are not in the hospital versus placebo. Um, Lauren, no, no, no. As I understand, the NIH is a prospective study. They're enrolling people. They're enrolling people, and I think they're probably going to have to say that they are positive from PCR uh, nasally or whatever. So it's not a retrospective study, Lauren. As I understand it, and I got to read it again to make sure I'm understanding, the NIH is setting up a prospective, looking in the future, a placebo arm, so a two-arm, dual-arm study. It's not retrospective because uh, those aren't as powerful. Those aren't as good as prospective studies. So I hope it's an NIH study. So it'll be funded right. They'll have enough numbers. There'll be greater power in it. And it's prospective. It'll be placebo. Uh, the only thing that it's not is double-blind, right? It's uh, Double-blind means that you give someone placebo pills and they don't know whether they're getting placebo pills or hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. So that's, I don't think it's, it's double blind, but it's placebo arm. So um, Marissa says they're still doing the antibody study through the NIH. Okay, so great. So, I mean, the NIH is doing all these. Again, I trust the studies coming out of the NIH. I know a lot of people are conspiracy nuts and they hate the government. They hate the NIH. They hate, you know, Fauci. They hate... Um, the World Health Organization, they hate, I mean, people right now seem to hate a lot of anybody in power or anyone in government. I just think it's an anti-authority issue. And again, I don't want to get political about this because I know as many, let's say, liberal people and progressive people as right-wing and conservative people who have a problem with everything from vaccines to Dr. Fauci to Bill Gates to the World Health Organization to pandemic, yada, 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 conspiracy nut, wear your tin hat. Um, people just have a problem with authority. <laughs> I think that's what it just boils down to. People have a problem, an authority problem, and especially a lot of Americans do, especially when they're sheltered in place or told to shelter in place, people have an issue. So um, that's mostly what I want to talk about, the hydroxychloroquine news. So let's look, wait for the NIH study about the mild thing. So I am not saying that there's no role for hydroxychloroquine. From the very beginning, you guys who joined me for the podcast have known, I've said there may be a role. And in the end, I hate to say it, but there may be a, you know, Trump may have been right, but for the wrong reasons. With, he had zero evidence. But the evidence may show that mild patients may benefit. In other words, outpatient medicine. Welcome to Andrew coming in from, gosh, New York. Andrew, I hope you and your friends are safe and your family and everyone there because he's in literally ground zero in New York City. Um, Andrew, uh, so we're talking about the role of hydroxychloroquine, um, and I've talked about Kawasaki illness and all antibody testing and hypoxia and out of uh, lung disease. You can look at it in, uh, you know, earlier, uh, later. So, but about hydroxychloroquine, uh, the mild, there may be a role outpatient for mild cases to take this. 
But again, we have to weigh the risks and benefits, right? If there's not much benefit from it and you don't see that it keeps people out of the hospital or that they recover from it, why would you give them the risks of the heart disease, right? Um, so Lauren says anecdotally, uh, welcome, Andrew. So uh, Lauren says anecdotally, she says, personally, I feel a mild case of done well on five-day treatment. So again, you know, I hate to say that Trump might have been right or that other people might have been right, but there may be a role. But again, Trump is obviously not a doctor. He's just sort of hopeful and he talks out of his ass all the time. Again, I'm really trying not to keep this political. But the point is, is that at some point, if the NIH study in another one or two months shows that there's a role for mild mild out of patient out of hospital patients to get uh hydroxychloroquine then there may be a role for let's say you're pcr positive not antibody positive because you're antibody positive you recover there's no role for antibody positive patients to get hydroxychloroquine ever as far as i can tell but there may be a role if you're a nasal positive and you're getting symptoms and it's early on let's say kind of like think about tamiflu right um, yeah, Brian, good point. He's 50% right. It helps or it doesn't. But okay, think about Tamiflu. I, I, I like, what do they say with Tamiflu? When you get Tamiflu for flu, they tell you you're supposed to take it within the first, what, 48 hours of your symptoms, right? And then you take it for five days. So hydroxychloroquine may come down to something like that, where it's like within the first 48 or 72 or 96 hours of having symptoms and being positive, then they will give you hydroxychloroquine and that will help. The problem is what? You have to test positive. So the problem is you need access to a test and a PCR test within 48 hours or actually within 24 hours because it may take a day for it to come back. So as soon as you're sick, you need access to a test. Let me ask you this. How many of you that are not living in New York think you can get access to a test within 24 hours and get those results back within 48 hours? I'm not confident. Even in Hawaii, Hawaii's got a lot of access, but I don't think maybe I can even get that. And a lot of places in the world for sure, but even in the country, cannot get diagnosed. Let's say you have a fever right now at like, what is it? Almost uh, 2 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time. Can you get tested and those results back by 2 p.m. on Saturday? I don't know. Right. And most people say no. So my point is, is it's hard finding a role for hydroxychloroquine because you don't want to give this to people who don't have it. But how do you know who has it? The only way to test it is either a PCR test, which no one can get, or a rapid test, which is shitty, right? Or sorry, even the rapid tests are usually antibody tests, as I understand but maybe there's a rapid just PCR test. If the rapid PCR test is good, but I don't know that we have many out there. As far as I know, there's no good ones. So the problem is, when do we get to use hydroxychloroquine? And that's the problem with hydroxychloroquine. It has too many side effects to recommend using it right away. Even if you find out, you know, you have to find out that you're sick early on. Like you don't want to use it. You're like, oh, well, I was sick you know, seven days ago, and I feel better now. I sort of over it. It was really crappy one or two weeks. Like Brian, I think, was sick for like more than two weeks. But my point is, is like we wouldn't have wanted to give hydroxychloroquine to Brian on like day 15 or 16, even if the results were good for that, because maybe it doesn't do much at that point. You know, again, this is something they're going to have to study for these tests, you know. Uh, yeah, so Lauren, yeah, you know, so that's the problem. We're stuck with getting a fast nasal PCR test. Uh, and then, you know, but again, I'm getting ahead of myself because that's just assuming that we get a good NIH study that shows mild cases will respond to hydroxychloroquine. Um, Beth's hospital can return results in 45 minutes, but not sure how accurate it is. Okay, so again, Brian, that's great if you go to the hospital to get it, right? But what are we running into problems? A lot of people don't want to go anywhere near a hospital. I'll tell you in Hawaii, our hospital volumes have fallen dramatically. No one goes to our ER. Last week, we had single digits in my hospital in Hawaii. And again, Hawaii, we are, sorry to use the phrase, but we are killing it, i.e. no one's getting killed and no one's dying from COVID-19. So we're doing really, really well. Um, so Brian says with the added pneumonia, he was out for about three weeks. Yeah, so this is tough with how we will eventually use hydroxychloroquine. I don't know. My best guess is that we're going to use it like Tamiflu. 
that we're going to say, you got to be tested positive with, and symptomatic within the last, like, again, 48 to 96 hours or whatever, and then we'll give you a five-day course of hydroxychloroquine. You know, I don't think they're going to say, oh, if you've been sick for three weeks, we'll give it to you. I really don't. Somewhere between two days and 14 days is if hydroxychloroquine shows a good effect in this NIH study, I think they'll recommend it. Now, remember, the only medicines that they are recommending that the F- I think the FDA is recommending officially, or maybe, the, I'm sorry, the CDC, is remdesivir. Remdesivir for really sick patients is an IV drug. There's a lot of good evidence about clotting and using Lovenox and our low-dose heparin or even heparin itself for patients. I talked about a lot about that on my last podcast um, to prevent clotting, to prevent that end organ damage to strokes and heads and uh, you know, maybe even kidneys and dialysis. So, uh, but again, these, the problem is Lovenox, low molecular weight heparin, heparin, um, uh, 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 and remdesivir, these are all drugs that you cannot uh, give really outside the hospital. I, I, well, I take that back because Lovenox and heparin are sub-Q. You could be given um, within uh, 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 its sub Q, but it, Lovenox is very, very expensive. So Lauren, yeah, my point is no, not for three weeks within the first five, 14 days I've seen it. Yeah, and you know what, Lauren, by the way, I've asked my, uh, our friend Shreyas. Shreyas is an ICU doctor, and doctors are still, even with the bad evidence in hydroxychloroquine, we are still, they're still using it off-label in later patients. But my problem is, There is no evidence for it yet. There still is no evidence for hydroxychloroquine, you know? So, um, yeah, but Lauren, so the problem I have with Lovenox, for example, Lovenox is a very expensive medication, right? The the insurance companies hate giving it out outside the hospital because it's very expensive. So you have to find the evidence. So number one, the insurance companies will have to pay for it, right? And number two, that you could give it to yourself outside. Again, Lovenox, I don't think will be recommended for people to give themselves outside. It's very, yeah, $200 a shot, right? So you're getting it twice a day. That's $400 a day. Oh, so Linda, Linda, okay, Linda, I really want to talk to her because she's Swedish living in uh, the U.S., but she knows everyone from Sweden. So Linda says, my grandpa tested positive back in Sweden, was at the hospital for like three weeks and got better. No clue what Viking meds they used there. Linda, I'd be really interested, but my guess is that especially he was older, they threw the kitchen sink at him. I bet you they gave him hydroxychloroquine. They probably gave him Lovenox. They may have given him remdesivir and everything else. Um, yeah, so, oh, Lauren, that's the out-of-pocket cost was 200 That's insane. So in other words, 200 a shot or for some... Dosing would be $400 a day. That's with insurance. That's a really expensive medication. I mean, most people will never take a medication that's $400 a day. So again, I think this is best left for the hospitals. Also, you got to you know, give it to yourself the right way. Most people can give it to you uh, sub-Q, um, uh, uh, subcutaneously in the hospital, but not everyone can give themselves subcutaneous medicines. Again, the most number one people who do it as diabetics. Diabetics give themselves insulin subcutaneously, right? So um, anyway, my point is, is that, yeah, see, so Lauren, I, I, I didn't know the actual number, but it is very expensive. So um, that's the uh, Hawaii update. Uh, a little bit more. Let me go. I think I'll turn now to the, the news a little bit. Hawaii is doing very well. As I mentioned before, we're opening up our malls, which I, I am a little unsure about. I mean, again, I'm not going to go out. And I hate, by the way, my new least favorite line from the open up the anti-stay-at-home protesters is, well, you don't have to go out. I'm going to go out. You can have the freedom to stay at home. It's all about freedom for them. Stay at home. And you know what? I'll be fine. I don't want to go to gyms. I don't want to go to high-risk areas. I don't want to get, um, um, you know, to these you know, packed beaches and nightclubs and whatever. And in in Hawaii, Kauai is opening up its beaches first, and we're only opening up our malls. We're not opening up our restaurants. We're not opening up our beaches still to anything except for, like me, going out to surf, which, man, damn it, the clouds came in, so I really don't know that I'm going to surf. I just don't want to get cold. Um, Welcome to Joanne coming in from Los Angeles. So, 
Joanne, uh, we got a lot of Herrix people here. We had Lauren, we had John Keane, we had Beth Walpert, we had um, Kim, uh, Kim Crowder coming in, a lot of people joining us. So Joanne, I'm talking about what's going on with COVID-19 with all the diseases, Kawasaki disease, COVID toes, hypoxia, strokes. I, I did a lot. This is one of the more productive uh, podcasts I've done in a while, thanks to Lauren. Um, Lauren, um, so surfing in rain, I thought was great. I, 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 yeah, but it's cold. And again, Lauren, I have a mild form of rain now. So my fingers get cold very easily. So I don't, even with it being warm, if it's below like, you know, 70 or in the, even, you know, getting lower than that, then I don't really like it that much. And Marissa is here too. Uh, Joanne, uh, Marissa and Lauren check out my podcast all the time. So Marissa said there's a new campaign to have people get outside into the sunshine, even just in their neighborhood. Too much in the house also not good for your health. Wear gloves, LOL. Yeah. <laughs> Two good points, Marissa. I agree. I think even if every day you just walk outside and get your vitamin D, get exposed, get whatever, but you know, still wear your mask. Lauren, I got to tell you, I'm a little anti-glove right now. I'll tell you why I'm anti-glove because all those people go to, you know, Costco and everywhere else. And what do they do? They wear the same gloves all day long. What do we do when we go into the hospital? We change our gloves after every patient, after every room. The person outside wearing the gloves never changes it. They're touching a dirty shopping cart. They're touching a dirty doorknob. They're touching a dirty person or dirty food or dirty whatever. So I don't, I don't like gloves. I would prefer people don't wear gloves and that makes them more careful. They wash their hands. They do other things. I don't like gloves. I, 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 oh, oh, for surfing. Okay, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Cross-contamination. So Lauren meant for surfing. Yeah, you know, Lauren, I don't wear gloves for surfing because that's cheating. <laughs> they have web gloves, they have Spider-Man type gloves that you can use to paddle and they help you catch the way better. I think that's cheating. And that's if you're old and really weak or you know some problem. I don't like wearing gloves um, generally, but yeah, good point. I could wear them, but you know. Anyway, so Linda says, how long do you think until we can travel again? I need a beach. Okay, so this is a really, this uh, segues into um, Hawaii thing. By the way, we have to quarantine. We can't even go to Maui. We can't go to Kauai now. That's how, that is how sick, uh, how crazy the, um, the uh, quarantine is right now. Um, uh, we can't even go to the other islands. <clears throat> we still have to 14 day quarantine. Like if I flew to Maui or Kauai, we have to quarantine. That's how severe it is. But the governor of Hawaii has said that possibly within the next two to six weeks, so what is that? By the end of June, we might be able to fly to Maui and Kauai without me in quarantine. So that's great. But for example, Linda, I think you can fly anywhere domestically. But the problem is if you're, let's say Kauai, right? Like I know everyone wants to come to Hawaii. I don't think Hawaii is going to open up that 14 day quarantine ever. I don't. Well, the way the news is talking, I don't think they're going to stop the 14 day quarantine. Now, that's not to say you can't get in another way. For example, the senator, uh, I think our senator, our Democratic senator, Ed Case, he's asked whether the, he asked the FAA, the Federal Aviation Agency, or whatever they're called, that manages the airports, whether we can test all people, all travelers coming to Hawaii. At first, I thought it was on landing, but he's asking to test them at the outside departing airport. So in other words, if you're flying from uh, Maryland, or you're flying from more likely Los Angeles or laying over in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Las Vegas, San Diego, Seattle, Portland. Those are the main um, uh, kind of airports, Oakland, uh, San Jose. Test those people there. And then by the time they get off at the airport, hopefully maybe they get the results back. And if they're negative, then they can come in. If they're positive, they quarantine. If they don't have them back, they quarantine for like one more day until they get through. So to Hawaii, my prediction is we did a really damn good job and we got lucky at having zero cases, one cases. Oh great, the sun's back out. I think I'm gonna go surf. One, one case, two cases, zero cases, three cases, zero cases, zero cases. Hawaii did such a great job and we got so lucky. We're basically the New Zealand of the United States of America. So, and yeah, we, we depend on tourism. I would say we depend on it even more than New Zealand. So 
New Zealand at least has massive farming and other stuff. We don't have a lot of that. So we really depend on tourism. So obviously we want tourists to come in. So that is going to be a problem. So I'm saying we're never going to let anyone come in from Hawaii without a test. I'm pretty sure about that because a lieutenant governor has said that. And I would anticipate that if you want to come to Hawaii, you're going to have to pay for this test or it will be added on to the cost of your ticket. Instead of a $250 ticket, it will be a $350 ticket, you know, one way or, you know, it will be for the outgoing flight. Obviously, they're not going to test you coming back. So, Brian, uh, yeah, we have pigs, we whatever, but we don't have big farms. And we have like, we have like big island beef, but it's really expensive. So we don't, I mean, not like New Zealand. My point is, I think there's a much bigger agricultural scene right now in New Zealand because it's generally a cheaper place and they have much more land than we do. So, um, uh, oh, so Linda, I, I, I love this because again, I am the traveling doctor and before I was a traveling doctor, I was the traveling bachelor and I've had all my trips canceled. Man, this is insane. I was supposed to go to New Orleans last month and with my family, my parents haven't even met their grandkid yet at all. And they may not meet him until he's like two years old. I, I was supposed to fly to Cyprus last week in Europe. Can't do that. And I am supposed to fly to Australia next month, Sydney. I'm definitely not doing that. By the way, Sydney and New Zealand is not letting anyone in, probably permanently, until the vaccine. They're only letting each other in because they apparently trust each other. And so other international travel, let's say, um, I don't know when that's coming back. That's on each country, who they let come back in from overseas and who they let come back in. For example, Linda, you're Swedish. I'm sure they'll let you back in, but they'll still probably quarantine you for 14 days. They won't let anyone else in. For example, you know what other airports that test you right at the airport? Vienna Airport and Dubai. They're really big and they make you, or at least Vienna, they charge you 190 euros. So what does that translate to? That's like 225 US dollars. That's more than 225 US dollars per passenger, they charge you for that test on landing. So I think, and my friends in Hawaii, I got an argument with one of my friends that said, that's too, too much, you know? And it's right, yeah, the test should only be like 50 to 100 dollars. I said, well, we should charge every person coming into Hawaii. Coming to Hawaii is a privilege, not a right. So if you wanna to come to Hawaii, pay 50 dollars or pay 100 dollars or don't come or quarantine for 14 days. And then you, you, know, you gotta pay for it. Um, the quarantine, what would you rather pay for? A 14-day hotel room or a one-time $50 or $100 test and then you can stay in a cheap hostel or go camping or do whatever else? I'd rather pay for that. So Linda says Sweden is too cold. Linda, that's right, but it's May and you know the Swedish summers are pretty fun. I want to go back. God, I miss Sweden. I miss Europe so much. It pains me. It physically pains me to not go travel to Europe this summer. And I had still held out hope that maybe by September, when the weather's still warm, I could go somewhere in Europe. By the way, Cyprus, where I was planning to go, has so few cases. But again, it doesn't make sense for me to travel internationally if I only have two weeks off, which I think is a lot of time, and I've got a quarantine for all those 14 days. So my point, long answer to anyone in America, unless you're going home to your home country, like Linda going back to Sweden, I would not plan on any travel to anywhere domestically at all. And Brian is going to laugh at this, but Brian, the only place domestically I'm planning to, tra uh, to um, travel to is either L.A. to see my family from a distance at some point or to do whatever, or maybe go to Nashville. Because Tennessee, Wyoming, Montana, North Dakota, Hawaii, Alaska, and I think a few other states are the only states that are doing so well that we're near zero cases. And I'm saying that's funny for Brian because I think Brian got sick. I'm sorry. I hope you don't mind me telling the story. I think Brian got sick going to Nashville. So my point is of all the, te the states that are better, the only one I find interesting that I would want to go to is Nashville, Tennessee probably because I've never been there. And I'm going crazy. I want to get on a plane too. But again, the problem is coming back, I would probably need to take a test again, which I'm fine doing if I'm safe enough, right? So um, so uh, Linda says Linda says Sweden doesn't have a stay-at-home order. I will get to that. I think that's the last thing I'll start talking about. And Brian says, as a state, I think it's a right if you are a U.S. citizen. No, well, Brian, uh, yeah, it's a right, but... 
you can you have to pay for it or you quarantine. That's it's those are the choices, right? It's a right to come to Hawaii, but if your choices are then you either pay for a hundred dollar test as or you quarantine, right? I mean you have two choices. I, I think that's I mean, trust me, I'm just telling you, Brian, you're not Hawaii, and maybe this will go to a Supreme Court or state Supreme Court or something, Hawaii, but you're not going to get in without a test I'm, uh, or a quarantine. I, 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 Hawaiians are very, very tribal right now. I, I have my pulse on uh, the entire island. I've talked to a lot of friends, and there are a lot of people that want to open it up, but a lot of people are still, everyone is distrustful of anyone outside Hawaii right now. So Sally says, I don't trust the airplanes. Everyone can get infected, recycled there. Yeah, I, guys, I don't know if you saw those articles about United Airlines. And every airline is under bankruptcy watch right now and very concerned. I, I'm worried about some airlines going bankrupt. I think Delta Airlines is losing something like $50 million a day. And you saw those pictures. They're supposed to isolate people and keep people away from the middle seat. And the pictures show they're completely full. So Sally, I'm like you. I'm concerned about those airplanes. I mean, I, I would trust my airplane leaving Hawaii, but I don't know that I would trust the airplane coming back into Hawaii because I know how Los Angelinos are, and they are not very serious about this at all. A lot of them are not, especially in Orange County, if you've seen the Huntington Beach protests. So Lauren says Tennessee is beautiful. Okay, Lauren, that's another vote for Tennessee. So maybe I want to go to Nashville uh, if I do any trip. That may be the only trip. And, and I have some time because I don't want to go in the middle of the summer when it's boiling hot. Maybe I can do a Nashville trip in September or October in the fall when it's more beautiful and stuff too. Um, I don't know that I'm traveling anywhere outside of Hawaii. So if I travel anywhere, I might be doing some staycations in the Big Island or Kauai or Maui probably this summer. I think that's the most likely thing. I and I know, boo-hoo, you feel so bad for me. I get to travel in Hawaii. You guys don't. I'm, I'm just telling you, Hawaii is going to follow a New Zealand and Australia model. We are not going to let anyone in. And you, we, can, we can talk about the constitutionality of that and whether or whatever, but that is going to happen. And that will have to go through the state courts, and we can keep people away long enough and give them the option. Test for $100 or quarantine. You have a choice. You can still come to Hawaii. You got to do one of those things. And, and that's why Ed Case is asking the FAA for that authorization. And so, Brian, you're right. But if the FAA say that's okay, then that's okay, you know? So, um, yeah, Aaron, I like it to paying a toll in the Hawaii. You know, Aaron, my point is, is a lot of my friends have said, you know, that's too expensive. $50 is too expensive of a test. $100 is definitely too expensive. I get this. But, hey, tickets are cheaper to come to Hawaii too, Right. And again, if you say per couple that you test two people for $100, it's $200, what? That's one extra hotel night. In my mind, I'm like, if you can't afford one extra hotel night to come to Hawaii, maybe you shouldn't be coming to Hawaii at all, you know? I mean, again, unless you're couch surfing or, you know, in a hostel, I understand some people camp, I get it. But my point is, I'm telling you, you're, it's going to fail miserably to tell everyone in Hawaii, just open it up without testing. Just do temperature scanning at the airport or something. No one's going to buy that. No one's going to buy that. Even your most aggressive, open-up person in Hawaii will not like that idea, and they will protest. They will protest for that, you know? Yeah. So um, Linda uh, Lauren says, Smoky Mountain. Okay, yeah, Lauren, I want to get good barbecue. Man, I'm sad because I want to see the music scene and the Nashville uh, ribs and that stuff. Maybe I can get takeout ribs there or something. Uh, so Smoky Mountains, and uh, you know, I just want to do something outside of Hawaii. Linda, I went on a cruise to Alaska race. So I've been there, but um, I don't know that I'm going to go back anytime soon. It's a really expensive state, too. Um, uh, yeah, Lauren, no, you know what? You would want to think that everyone says, uh, Lauren says everyone should want to be tested for getting on a plane. You would think that, right? Logically? <laughs> Trust me. Trust me, I guarantee you that probably a good 40, 30 to 40% of America will not want to get tested. Because like, I feel okay, I don't have a fever, a temperature should be enough, I'm not sick, I don't want to pay the money. I can think of 10 different reasons, 100 different reasons they will not want to get tested. Number one, just the cost. They won't want to, because that makes the ticket more expensive for them. And that, you know, and that's annoying, again, you know, like, I, again, I think I'm in a very unique position being in Hawaii. So Brian says, for some reason, people seem to think Disneyland is all right also. 
Um, again, Brian, I got to tell you, man, I don't care how much they space out those patients or patients. <laughs> you see what I did? Freudian slip. I don't care how much they, they, they spread out you know, the people who might become patients in Disneyland and whatever. You are essentially increasing your risk like you would increase your risk for religious services, right? Increase your risk by going to the gym. I saw a, a, a video someone sent me of a bunch of treadmills where they put plastic dividers between all the treadmills and all the um, uh, uh, um, ellipticals and stuff. So listen, oh, I wanna mention this last thing. This is going pretty late. What time is it? It is 2, Jesus, I've been going almost 90 minutes. Okay, so I'm gonna stop pretty soon, but one of the last things I wanna talk about, there was a crazy study that came out from the CDC and they looked at uh, uh, singing, right? They looked at a choir. There was a choir in Washington. I don't know if you guys saw this article and Linda and Aaron and a lot of people mentioned cruises. Yeah, I would not be caught dead in a cruise. I would not be caught dead in line in anywhere in Disney World or Disneyland anywhere. You're just asking for trouble. I hope you get refunds and I hope you get you know, some uh, uh, COVID uh, refund clause available. Uh, otherwise, I would not show up at all. I wouldn't show up to any, I honestly, I wouldn't go to any amusement park or anything uh, until there's a vaccine personally. Or I know that I've recovered from it, like like uh, Brian did, and even then we don't know these antibodies are forever, right? So, um, yeah, you see. So Brian, everyone, yeah. So Brian, Brian, basically Americans are selfish and a little entitled. That's what we're saying, right? Um, yeah, and Greg, you're right. Flights might get really expensive next year, so it'll be a mixed bag. I think the days of easy travel might be over. So this again, this is the last thing I want to end on this, and this is scary. The CDC study about the choir, there was a church choir in Washington, state of Washington. There was something like 80 people in this choir, right? And all they did was get together and sing. They sang, which is what? You breathe, you huff, you puff, you maybe sweat a little bit if you're singing pretty hard like Andrea Bocelli. You, you, you expel vapor, right? You've seen those like uh, thermal imaging thingies where you see the vapor come out. So 80 people were singing in this choir. You know how many people got sick of COVID-19? From one person, one person that was sick. 40-something people got sick out of these 80 people. In other words, more than half, about 50% of people got sick just from being around one sick singing individual. Two of those people died. I think four of them went to the hospital and two of them died. And... That is a pretty, pretty crappy um, statistic, I think. And that scares me for singing. That scares me for masses, religious, because what happens when you go to church? Think about the term mass. What does that imply? A mass of people, right? Think about singing. Even if you're singing, hey, I, you know, this sounds stupid, but if I were ever to go to church, I'm going to sit in the very back singing forward, right? Because if you sit in the front row, everyone's breathing and singing towards you, right? I'd rather sit in the very back, but I wouldn't even go to a church. I'm telling you straight up. And I wouldn't go to a karaoke session. Brian knows. I love myself my, some karaoke. I wouldn't go to a karaoke bar. I wouldn't go to karaoke. Where, like, but the problem is not even about the singing. It's about what? It's about speaking. It's about whatever. So when people say we don't need a mask, tell them about the study. Tell them about the study. I don't need to wear a mask. I don't need to do whatever. Oh, this, that. I'm breathing with my nose outside. Tell them about the CDC study with the singing. And they say, oh, well, singing isn't the same as talking or speaking. You want to take that chance? Do you want to take that? And another thing that's a pet peeve of mine, when I go out shopping and people are, see their friend in a, in a story like, hey, what's up? And then they take their mask down, right? Like, hey, I think it's a natural unconscious thing. Like, you want people to see your mouth. You want people to see your, your facial movements and your expressions. So uh, that's pointless. You should not take your mask off when you're speaking to your friends and you run into them. That's the absolute worst thing. Number one, you're closer to them. Number two, they're your friends, right? They're your friends. You don't want to give them sick in case you're sick and you won't want them to give you sick. And when you both pull down your mask, what the hell do you think is going on? Like, so anyway, use the CDC article. And you can look it up. Just type in CDC choir COVID-19 into Google. I'm sure you'll find it. Okay, so Sally says even Mandalay Bay is thinking reopening minus 25% occupancy. Yeah, it's really bad. 
Sally, they're saying in uh, Hawaii, we don't even think we're going to get to 40% occupancy before the end of the year. Usually we're 80, 85, 90% occupancy. Um, yeah, so Aaron, so it's really, yeah. So remember, if we can get this next to someone singing, in my mind, you have to at least entertain the possibility you can get it next to someone talking, right? So just keep that in mind, yeah? Um, yeah, and Greg, yeah, so the six speed is not an exact number. It's just a, um, it's just a recommendation, right? It at least sets some protocol on it. Yeah, yeah, so Lauren, you're right. I, I don't know if you've seen that meme where it said like, if you're wearing your mask like this with your nose out, it's like wearing your underwear like this with your junk out, you know? Like it doesn't, I mean, I, I don't think it's, it, it, the point is, is it, it doesn't really, I would say it's more like, it's like wearing a condom with it like, just like, I don't know how, like on, on, on your, I don't know. On, on your nose or on your like, you know, other part that's not covering your you know what. I think that's a more appropriate analogy. Wearing a mask with it not covering your nose is like wearing a condom with it only covering your testicles. That's basically what I mean. <laughs> like, what's the point of that? What's the point of that, you know? So um, yeah, Lauren, I agree. People are taking a mask on and off. I, I personally would only touch a mask only if you really, really, really need to readjust it or, um, yeah, LV, great, great, great example. It's like wearing a condom with the tip poked off, cut off, or with like holes in it. Like, why the hell would you do it? Yeah, Brian, exactly. It's like taking the condom off. It's like you wear your condom and then you take it off when you see your partner and you tie it around your testicles and then you continue to have sex with them, right? Like, it's, you wouldn't do that or I, I, I think your partner would laugh at you. Um, or not probably more like not have sex with you and then same thing why would you take your mask off for your friend so that is my new pet peeve as we reopen right everyone's going to be going out there with just their fabric mask other thing and this can happen more and more i know you guys have seen this where you run into friends or you see a group of friends and the first thing they do they take that mask off hey what's up you know i think what everyone should do i think what should be funny Someone should print. I know that you can get a, a custom made, you know, like my face, my lips. By the way, the iPhone, the face uh, uh, opening thing, the face ID doesn't work, but get a face mask that prints your face on it. I think that's hilarious. It'll scare the crap out of kids and little babies, but I think that's funny, you know? So anyway, uh, Lauren says a healthy person is putting themselves at risk just by constantly taking on and off. Uh, and Lynn says there's a virologist convinced he got the COVID-19 through eyes on a plane because he's wearing masks and disinfecting the whole flight. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, Lynn, the one I read was that there's a virologist that was convinced he got it because he had contact lenses. And he said that it'd be better to uh, wear glasses. And that's one other thing. Yeah, I mean, if I were wearing contact lenses, I don't because I have LASIK. I would rather, uh, I personally would rather... Um, just not wear contact lenses for the foreseeable future and only wear glasses. Uh, Lauren mentions that people are going to go shopping at a number of stores, do not take off masks to clear all errands. 100% Lauren, if I walk into something public place, I won't touch my mask at all for anything. Hand sanitize on the way in if you can. Hand sanitize on the way out, especially if you've touched these shopping carts and food and shelves and different things and you put back a box of cereal that you don't want, right? Yeah, Lauren, 100%. I wouldn't even wear gloves because gloves mess everything up. Just stay safe. Wash your hands. Have your little extra hand sanitizer if you want your sanitizing wipes. And do that, you know. But don't take that mask. Don't fidget with your mask. I know it's really hard, especially for kids, right? That's another thing you got to ask yourself. You want to bring your kids and little children around everywhere. And you know they can't stop touching anything, especially their face, right? Um, and I know there's a little controversy about how old you have to be for wearing a mask. So um, I, I will address that maybe another time. Brian says, new update removes the wait for face ID error before you can choose to use a passcode. Yeah, Brian, but I think it'll be funner to get the face mask. I just want to buy one because I want to freak people out. And I would rather just wear that, you know. Anyway, okay, guys, uh, man, I went super long today. This is like a hundred minute podcast. I was going to go uh, less. But guys, thanks everyone for coming in. Um, I will do a podcast, uh, you know, Monday, I'm actually on a night shift, so I may do an earlier podcast. I might do like a, uh, a 10 a.m. 
a Hawaii podcast before I go to bed um, because I'll be sleeping at 1 p.m. and I'll be working at um, at uh, 7 p.m. Uh, Hawaii time. So I don't know that I can do the podcast next Monday except for earlier because I am on the night shift. Uh, Thursday, I'll go back to my more normal time. So next week, again, uh, Monday, it will be weird time like 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Um, Eastern, and then... Um, uh, Thursday, it will be back to your normal times. Uh, I have a couple days off next week. I just doing a couple night shifts. So, uh, guys stay safe again. Uh, again, please share this. I'm uh, as much better quality video. I am shooting again on my iPhone cause I still haven't figured out the, uh, Google, uh, the Facebook live problem on Google Chrome and Safari. Um, stay safe, uh, forward this along to all your friends and family. Um, tell them about it. It's on my YouTube channel uh, under The Traveling Doctor. You can also find me Twitter at The Traveling DR, on Instagram at The Traveling underscore MD. Obviously, on Facebook, The Traveling Doctor, uh, Dr. Albert Lin signing off again. And again, these views represent myself. You can read my disclaimer. Uh, I'm representing only myself. So uh, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, please stay safe. Uh, I miss you all. <laughs> This is a little bit, again, like my therapy um, and because I can't really see anybody and I may not see a lot of you in person for a long, long time. Uh, and it hurts me that I can't see my family too, even with Mother's Day just recently too. So hope you guys all had a good Mother's Day and um, uh, hug your loved ones and stay safe, wash your hands, and I'll see you next time, okay? Aloha, guys.